Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everybody. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, edition of the Epidemics and Ethics uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Ross Upshur. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto and it's my great pleasure to chair this session. We are absolutely fortunate today to have three top rate uh, insightful speakers uh, to talk about the topic uh, a uh, on COVID, a case for research exceptionalism. So the question here is given a global uh, emergency, public health emergency of international concern, an unprecedented uh, pandemic, uh, social uh, economic disruption, morbidity and mortality, uh, do we need to think about, amend, uh, rethink the way that we uh, engage in research and some of the processes? So to talk about that today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Alex London, who's uh, at the Center for Ethics and Policy at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Professor Clement Adabamawo, uh, who's at the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and Catherine Wright from the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. So I'm going to call on Professor London first, uh, and you, each of the speakers is going to talk for about 10 minutes. Uh, I encourage uh, attendees that if they have questions to put them in the chat line, and uh, we will then uh, arrange that, the, uh, 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 that our speakers are uh, able to uh, access them. So over to you, Professor London, and once again, thanks to our speakers for taking time out of their busy schedule and to all of you for attending today. Over to you, Alex. There we go. Thank you very much, Ross. Uh, and um, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to be here. I'm going to talk about um, why I am against and why you also ought to be against pandemic research exceptionalism. Um, Sorry, let's get the, um, just as an acknowledgement that uh, this talk is uh, based on joint work with my colleague Jonathan Kimmelman at McGill uh, and draws on some work from uh, our paper against pandemic research exceptionalism that appeared in Science uh, a little while ago. Um, so public health emergencies are a volatile mix of uncertainty and urgency and nobody likes uncertainty, but uncertainty is the foundation for ethical research. So in this talk, I want to talk about two things that we need to guard against. Uh, we have to guard against ethically problematic means of reacting to uncertainty. The first is myopic decision making. And the second is taking urgency to justify reducing the quality of standards that are used to generate evidence so that we can generate that evidence more quickly. So biopic, by myopic decision making, this is the idea that the fundamental ethical concern is the duty of the individual caregiver to provide care to their individual patient, regardless of what other caregivers think or would do. So the idea that our RCTs are inconsistent with the clinician's duty of care in crisis situations is a very common uh, belief. It, uh, it um, happened during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, um, and it played an important role in, in a study uh, that has had a pretty significant effect uh, during the current outbreak. So here's a quote from the New York Times. We're not going to tell someone, listen, today is not your lucky day. You're going, you're getting the placebo. You're going to be dying. He, Dieter Rout, told me. So this is an interview with Rout. He believes it to be unnecessary in addition to being unethical to run randomized controlled trials of treatments for deadly infectious diseases. So, um, <clears throat> My claim here is that myop, this sort of myopic decision-making is self-defeating. The focus on the individual duty of care obscures the social nature of uncertainty and disagreement. So what you have in the care setting is that you have some experts who use a particular intervention. This could be hydroxychloroquine, it could be anything. Others don't. Some patients will receive that intervention, others won't. This happens in a context in which it's very difficult to learn because there are so many confounders uh, and so much noise in the environment. In a randomized controlled clinical trial, some patients also will receive the intervention. Other, people's, other patients will not receive the intervention. Because of the background uncertainty or disagreement between uh, uh, experts, each person in the study receives an intervention that would be recommended for them by an informed expert. It's just that because different experts disagree, different participants will receive different treatments. Allowing that treatment to be allocated by randomization 
creates the conditions that will control for confounding and promote learning. So refusal to conduct a randomized controlled trial makes nobody better off and leaves many stakeholders worse off by prohibiting the generation of evidence that will uh, establish the clinical merits of the interventions that are in question. Um, so commenting on some of the problems with the initial route study, Kim and colleagues say, given the urgency of the situation, some limitations may be acceptable including the small sample size, use of an unvalidated surrogate endpoint, and lack of randomization or blinding. Well, when we read this, we thought, what's left? Uh, all of those are sort of uh, cornerstones of sound scientific method. This is uh, a, a recent review of some of the studies that have been launched uh, during the current pandemic. One of the uh, conclusions uh, that the authors of this study draw is that even before the results of these studies are known, most studies likely will not yield meaningful scientific evidence at a time when the rapid generation of high quality knowledge is critical. Part of this is because of the proliferation of small studies. So uh, in this uh, review of the 1,551 studies for COVID-19, only 238, 35.8%, plan to enroll more than 100 participants. 640, or 41.3%, were observational studies. Uh, this is from uh, STAT on July 6 of 2020. Uh, here they show <clears throat> of 1,200 studies that have been launched in the current uh, outbreak, one in six of those studies focused on hydroxychloroquine. Of 685,000 anticipated participants, 35% or 230,000 were to be enrolled in studies of hydroxychloroquine. So that intervention and so many studies focusing on that single hypothesis soaked up resources that could have been better distributed over many of the other important interventions that we're, that we're studying. A systematic review of 25 health studies relating to COVID-19 zero percent, uh, this was for uh, mental health interventions, zero uh, percent pre-registered their study design, primary outcomes or analysis plan, 7.14 percent, uh, only seven percent included an a priori power analysis, and 10 percent used random sampling methods to recruit their participants. So uh, part of the problem with uh, poor quality studies is that clinically meaningful effects are rarely silver bullets. If you have a very small study, you've powered your study to detect a huge effect. Small uncontrolled trials often show misleading signals of promise. So the studies that we do that are part of the development trajectory uh, for new drugs, uh, phase ones, phase two, very often uh, uh, show promising results that are then shown not to be, um, uh, to be spurious in phase three studies. So what you get with the proliferation of poor quality studies is that stakeholders are left to read confounded tea leaves as though they can look inside the causal matrix and see which results are confounded and which results are not. So uh, our point is that some evidence now can be worse than no evidence if the evidence that we generate now is misleading. So what we have seen with hydroxychloroquine, for example, is the shift in practice behavior without proper warrant. So it's been delivered to thousands of, uh, of people. It's been politicized. Um, those sorts of early results also shift patient preferences without evidence of benefit. So it's been difficult. So there's been a seesaw effect. Um, patients have uh, wanted to avoid some clinical trials in the United States of hydroxychloroquine because they wanted to get it directly when they believed that it was uh, going to be a uh, silver bullet. Um, as evidence emerged that um, it wasn't effective and that it had some adverse side effects, uh, patients uh, wanted to avoid uh, trials in which they might be randomized to it. So that kind of shift in preference without adequate evidentiary warrant uh, makes no patients better off and it prevents studies that are needed to detect the presence or absence of meaningful clinical effect all of this represents a hugely inefficient use of scarce resources. The resources that it takes to mount these trials 
uh, the uh, contributions and uh, sacrifices of patients uh, and study participants who are in these trials and delays the, de the um, availability of evidence that many stakeholders need in order to discharge their important moral responsibilities. So I think it's a false dichotomy to say that either we act now on the available evidence or we wait for research to generate better evidence. The reason is that research itself is a responsible means of responding to uncertainty. Within the context of a well-designed clinical trial, some patients will get access to potential interventions, but they will get access under conditions that control for confounding. In the presence of clinical equipoise, no participant receives a level of care that falls below what would be recommended for them by at least a reasonable minority of expert clinicians. So when we quickly generate evidence that clinicians, health systems, policymakers need to discharge their moral responsibilities, then we're, we're taking a responsible means of addressing uncertainty. So uh, I'll close with these, um, five features that um, in our uh, paper in science, we argue uh, that um, studies that are conducted even during an ep a pandemic ought to have, they ought to address important questions or where, those, where that means key evidence gaps. They should use a rigorous design where partly what that means is that negative studies are going to also be meaningful. It's not going to be that you say, oh, there was no silver bullet. It's going to be that uh, a clinically meaningful effect is not present and we can leave this intervention behind. We need analytical integrity in our studies, so pre-specified designs and analyses. We need proper reporting that's consistent with pre-specification and, uh, and the relevant context in which the results were generated. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, in order for high quality studies to be feasible, we have to get beyond the individualism that predominates um, the non-pandemic context and foster greater collaboration and cooperation and use adaptive designs that are flexible so that uh, interventions that are underperforming can be dropped and, inter and interventions that are doing well can be promoted. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor London. Uh, over to you, Professor uh, Adamamoyo. Oh, Clement, you're on mute still. Yeah, that's just as well, since I have to go through the ritual of sharing my screen. <laughs> uh, what have we done? Apparently people are having difficulty with the sound, so perhaps if you could uh, increase the volume on your microphones as well. Okay. So hi everyone, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak uh, on issues relating to research ethics and research exceptionalism in the COVID pandemic. Um, I've been invited to this panel, I believe, because of my role as the chair of the Nigerian National Health Research Ethics Committee during the Ebola virus disease um, epidemic that occurred um, in West Africa and the anxieties that were generated by uh, that disease and the risk that it was going to spread globally. So during that uh, period, we um, took certain decisions and wrote a paper on um, conduct of research during acute viral um, pandemics. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of discussions about the issues that we raised and um, possibly about whether those issues are relevant in the current COVID uh, pandemic. So just a brief recap that the principles of the conduct of clinical trials and um, uh, 
research ethics are fairly well established. Um, and, you know, there is no controversy there about what the steps should be. But during acute viral pandemics, there are new considerations that uh, encourage us to review these principles and challenge us to ask whether indeed uh, the paradigm is sufficient and if we need to consider alternatives. So the characteristics of viral pandemics are well known. I won't go over those. And we are all familiar with the uh, principles of research ethics uh, as articulated uh, in the um, famous book uh, by Beecham and Childress, uh, The Principles of Biomedical Ethics. And this principles framework is the basis for most uh, research ethics guidelines uh, throughout the world. Um, they continue to be challenged, uh, the limitations, and uh, particularly uh, the lack of consideration of certain elements in moral philosophy uh, and the limited input into those uh, major principles from low and middle income countries uh, when they were being uh, developed. And this is very important when we're considering acute viral pandemics because they tended uh, until COVID uh, to generally start in low and middle income countries where there's limited infrastructure, personnel, and resources. And so um, whether the principles that were developed within the context of um, middle class developed country with access to high quality healthcare, adequate resources and uh, personnel uh, will translate easily into the new uh, context. Um, I note that the uh, COVID pandemic uh, certainly is different in, in several ways from the Ebola virus disease pandemic that uh, we confronted at that time. And that difference is important in uh, thinking about these issues going forward. So the differences were that, you know, the EVD was uh, rapidly spreading disease. The mortality rate at the time that we were considering these issues in Nigeria was about 70%. It was decimating the healthcare worker population generating a lot of panic in the society. And there was a lot of pressure to fast track any initiative or investigational treatment uh, that may be in the pipeline. Um, so we acknowledge that the most robust way of generating evidence was to conduct randomized clinical trials but we were also at that time faced with these other issues and we had to systematically review um, the questions that were raised by the pandemic. Uh, and those questions essentially were that, you know, you have this acute novel disease rapidly spreading, no treatment and no resources uh, to mount an appropriate public health intervention. Uh, so should we endorse the use of non-validated treatments or insist that only products that have gone through randomized clinical trials should be used in the management of patients uh, during the pandemic? We also had to consider uh, where is equipoise in a situation where there is no known effective treatment. Uh, as I mentioned, the mortality rate was so high and because of the infective nature of the disease, 
um, it was affecting the poorly equipped healthcare workers who were exposed to it. Uh, and there was also the question of the role of placebo uh, at that time. So we um, evaluated these issues and decided that um, yes, randomized clinical trial remains the gold standard, but um, non-validated treatments that have advanced sufficiently through the pipeline of clinical development could also be used and data collected in a pragmatic clinical trial fashion in order to generate evidence. We acknowledge that context is critical and multifactorial. Um, the context for the Ebola virus disease pandemic in, in West Africa at that time is different from the COVID pandemic in, in, in the United States in terms of personnel, infrastructure, uh, and other resources. Um, we were also concerned that acute viral pandemics, particularly you know, the Ebola virus from what we knew then, do not have any interpandemic clinical um, uh, presentation that we can say, okay, on t you know, when the major pandemic goes away, we have patients that we can continue to do research on and develop new treatments. So these were the issues that were confronted and um, we then recommended this adaptive clinical trials designed uh, to cope with those uh, emergencies. And we emphasized repeatedly that RCTs remain the gold standard and that they are the uh, approach that will give the most robust answers uh, in, in that situation. Um, so for COVID, um, we have a different um, set of uh, questions to consider. And the way I've been looking at these questions is to creates a two by two table of some sort uh, and to consider what the preferred options might be and what options are not preferred and put in each of the boxes the potential for any option that's preferred to enhance the elements of research ethics or to weaken it, to weaken either the, you know, weaken the positive or negative elements, or weaken the, um, uh, you know, the, the application of the principles to research ethics in general. And this is the paradigm that we've been developing, and we're going to take forward to apply to the uh, application of research ethics to the COVID pandemic and other pandemics to give bioethicists some framework with which to think about these issues in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clement. Catherine, over to you. Thank you. Let me just share my screen likewise. Okay, well, thank you, Ross, and thank you, um, Catherine, for the invitation to join this panel and reflect the recent work by the Liverpool Council on Bioethics and the implications for trial design. Um, I want to begin with a quick introduction um, to put what I'm going to say in context about the, the, the work by the Liverpool Council. So the aim of the project I'm drawing on today was to identify ways in which research can be conducted ethically in emergencies, recognising, I think, as previous speakers have reflected, there's a real dilemma here. The good quality evidence is absolutely essential, both for effective response now in the midst of an emergency and in the future. But at the same time, emergencies are highly non-ideal circumstances in which to conduct research. We identified a number of features across very different kinds of emergency, which we felt were common to all of them, about disruption from a norm, about the major need, both at population and individual level, about the urgency, 
um, involved affecting research timelines. And also, um, I think really importantly, the, the human element, the human distress involved in emergency. So back in 2018, we set up a two year project supported by an international working group and evidence gathering across 30 countries. And in January this year, I think just three days before the WHO um, announced that COVID was a public health emergency of international concern, we published a very detailed report with, with policy recommendations. Um, we covered a very wide range of emergencies from pandemics, which are our current focus, to natural and human-made disasters, including reflecting how those could overlap. So the particular challenges of COVID in um, refugee environments um, and, and so forth. We looked at many different kinds of health-related research, and we also took a, took a very broad approach to what counts as an ethical issue. I think a key message of our report was the need to take a much broader approach to what constitutes research ethics. What I'd like to do in this brief presentation is to touch the ethical compass, which the working group devised as a guide to thinking through ethical dilemmas, both on the ground and at policy level focusing particularly on certain aspects of what we meant by equal respect for persons, what it is to demonstrate respect for others as moral equals, particularly in the midst of an emergency, and then think through what this means for trial design and whether emergencies really are different. So here's a representation of the ethical compass we devised with its three core values of helping reduce suffering, equal respect and fairness. I'm not going to try and go through this in detail, um, what I wanted to do is highlight the questions, prompts, if you, if you like, for researchers and for policymakers that we included in the diagram under the heading of equal respect. So firstly, how will communities be involved in planning the research? Secondly, how will research design be sensitive to local values? And thirdly, what can be done to ensure participants are treated respectfully throughout the whole research life cycle? I think the link between equal respect and these practical prompts for how research should be organised perhaps needs a little bit more unpacking. Starting with the third question, I think it's fairly non-controversial to say that demonstrating respect for others as moral equals is a crucial part of the one-on-one -on -one relationships between researchers and participants. It was at the heart of what we think about when we plan our consent processes, when we think about recruitment. And I think perhaps it's less often thought about, but should be in terms of ongoing relationships, including the courtesy of giving feedback about study findings. However, we also argued that respect for others as moral equals isn't limited to these personal relationships that take place between the research team and participants on the ground. Rather, it should underpin the whole way the research is conceptualized and conducted. So if equal respect is to underpin the whole research endeavor, this involves a different kind of approach and interaction between those responsible for designing research and the populations where that research is taking place. Firstly, it involves taking context seriously, and to quote from our report, taking people's practices, traditions and values seriously, and being alert to and sensitive to prevailing assumptions and norms. Secondly, and I think even more importantly, it involves taking human emotions seriously. Again, to quote, not ethical principles for human beings, so ethical principles for human beings, not automatons. And that's thinking about the people involved in research not as idealized, ultra-rational decision makers, but as situated human beings in disrupted circumstances with many competing pressures and priorities. So what does all this mean for trial design? Well, the starting point, as previous speakers have, have, have alluded to, for trial design must be scientific validity. A, a study must be capable of producing meaningful results. Otherwise, we're all wasting our time from funders down to researchers and participants but it must also be acceptable to the communities where the research is being conducted, um, including in multi-site, multi-country studies, all those communities. If a particular design is highly controversial, if it causes distress and anxiety, for example, because of the perceived loss of hope to benefit from novel interventions, it may make it impossible to recruit adequately and the study will not be feasible. So the scientifically perfect trial that can't recruit enough participants doesn't yield any useful results. I think you could leave that point there as a point about feasibility. I think there's also a really important ethical point there, which is that riding roughshod over public anxiety and distress over a proposed design is not respectful. And picking back some of the Clements points about the experience of Ebola trials in West Africa and then in, in, in the DRC, in West Africa there was real distress over the perceived loss of hope 
the novel interventions were being compared to a standard of care that was perceived as hopeless. Um, a couple of years later, the DRC, by contrast, a trial design that compared novel interventions against each other was supported and achieved meaningful results. So I'm sure we'll come back to this more in the discussion, but I think a quick, a quick um, reflection on what this does and what it doesn't mean. I think what it does mean is that declaring particular types of study design as either ethical or unethical in the abstract isn't necessarily helpful. It's not taking account of, of, of the context and of the human emotions involved. However, it doesn't mean, firstly, that community acceptability is the only ethical concern. This isn't about outsourcing ethical responsibility, as it were, from ethics committees, researchers, funders, and others to communities. This is an additional step. Um, all the other, the, the, the remaining um, ethical considerations still remain and the same responsibilities remain. And I think really importantly, it doesn't mean that anxieties or objections have to be accepted unchallenged. But the fact that there's a worldwide anti-vax movement um, it, fueled by fake news, by social media, doesn't mean that we can't and shouldn't do, do vaccine trials. But these kind of concerns have to be addressed through respectful engagement. And to quote a West African anthropologist in a meeting we held in Senegal last year, looking at engagement in trials, he described the need to bring two worlds face to face to build consensus. I think other speakers said maybe consensus isn't possible, but at least you have to have a, a, an understanding of, of where each is coming from and a workable way forward. So finally, are emergencies exceptional? Well, I think emergencies are much more difficult places in which to conduct research for the reasons we've all touched on, the disruption, the time pressures, the great health need, and I think in particular, the great emotional impact which those living through um, the, 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 the emergency are, are having to contend with. But I think what we learn in emergencies, and this crucial requirement to be sensitive to context and to the reality of human emotion, helps cast a light on, on how we could do better, more respectful research in all circumstances. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thanks to the uh, participants for their stimulating and uh, highly uh, and presentations of uh, exceptionally high quality. Now, of course, uh, while you were giving your presentations, the uh, questions have started to come in. And uh, one quest set of questions kind of clusters around uh, trying to understand how it is in the first place uh, that small, poor quality trials are getting funded through regulatory uh, uh, levels um, and through uh, ethics review boards. Uh, how, how is it that the, the kind of oversight mechanisms of the scientific process can play a, a better, more uh, a directive role here? Does anybody want to take a crack at that? Clement, I see you're shaking your head, so I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> I wasn't shaking my head, I was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that you were giving us that sage wise, yes, I have an answer to this question. No, it, it really is challenging. I mean, when we hear about the studies that have been conducted, um, it, it suggests that there are gaps in the ethical review process, uh, which um, is one of the things that we're thinking about in generating this framework of um, how ethics committees should be thinking about approving or reviewing um, these types of studies. We acknowledge that there needs to be different weighting, different balancing, uh, consideration of additional uh, moral philosophical uh, principles beyond the classic uh, um, four principles. And uh, it may be the case that uh, uh, the ethics committees are coming to these uh, different conclusions from their application of those principles, which is one of the fundamental criticisms of uh, the principles approach in any case. So um, that may be what we're saying. Thanks. Uh, Alex or Catherine, would you like to weigh in? I, I think I, I'll just say, I think this reveals a uh, fundamental limitation of the way that we've designed our regulatory and oversight systems to focus on individual study protocols. Um, you know, an, an IRB sees a protocol, they're asked to look at that protocol and ensure, you know, a checklist of requirements, regardless now of what other, how many other protocols there are, 
So you can have 1,200 studies, small, tiny studies in a bunch of different places, re recruiting a few people. A as an IRB member, you might say it would be better if there were half a dozen studies that were all recruiting um, into a single uh, statistical design, but you're not empowered to uh, say to uh, investigators, you have to collaborate with other people in order to create a larger study that's going to get um, valid results in a short period of time. And I, I think that, you know, th this is an issue in the, in, in the intra-pandemic uh, uh, times, it, but it's seen much more clearly uh, in an outbreak like this. Thanks. Catherine? I, I mean, I'd very much echo what Alex said. I think it's very hard for an individual IRB or ethics committee to take that overview, but whether they even feel licensed to do so. Um, it seems to me that one needs to push the actual responsibility further back, and particularly the, the, the funders of these studies. So why are funders um, you know, agreeing to go ahead with a study which clearly is not powered to achieve what it needs to do, and without the sort of the collaboration either across funders or expecting kind of collaboration between research centres in, in different countries or whatever to make sure it is adequately powered. But obviously the solidarity trial and so on, which the WHO has been supporting, is exactly that kind of endeavour. Great, thanks. So another set of questions has arisen about feasibility and the question reads, seems like feasibility is an important consideration for the ethical justification of different kinds of studies. Uh, would the speakers care to comment on how we should think about feasibility of research in the current pandemic? Who wants to be the first one to take a... I'll call on Alex. I'm just gonna pick on people. This, that's, uh, <laughs> That's a bit. So <clears throat> I actually think feasibility is the, is sort of the, the focal point um, because it, it, it's where, it, it's what people use to say, well, this is why we only have a few uh, participants because, you know, we, we, uh, our, our funding was limited uh, or our time frame was limited. So, um, you know, uh, because of feasibility, that's what they use to sort of shave off uh, things that affect the uh, analytical integrity of studies, uh, you know, our, our view is feasibility is really a function not of what can you as an individual uh, PI do, uh, but um, what, what sort of avenues for collaboration and resource pooling are available so that you can produce the information that's going to be a public good um, and that, that we all need. So I, I think that that pushes in the opposite direction. Instead of weakening the inferential power of studies. We need to preserve the inferential power of studies. And in order to ensure feasibility, we need to uh, foster collaboration and cooperation. I think th this is, in effect, the leadership in the UK with recovery has been absolutely a boon, not, not just domestically, but for all of us uh, all over the world. And the inability of other countries to have that kind of, uh, or, 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 or um, collections of countries uh, to to quickly mount that kind of collaborative response, um, I think is um, is a real problem. Uh, Catherine or Clement, do you want to speak to that? And what about the global status of clinical trials platforms? I think many countries around the world simply don't have clinical trial platforms, even if they wanted to. Uh, Catherine. But I mean, I was going to come in on, on this point about sort of social value or public good. It does come back to the question of, of why you're doing the study in the first place. And if it's not going to be powered in a way that is adequate um, or you're not collaborating with others to ensure that it is, then it seems to me to undermine the whole, the whole justification for, for, doing, for doing the study in the first place. Um, you know, in terms of the UK recovery trial um, and the and use of global platforms, I, mean, I, think, I think it has been remarkable how many... Um, but both, both the actual structure of involving people and also you know, the enthusiasm clearly of, of members of the public of, 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 to become participants. And that, that does feel like a, quite a serious success story. Um, I think that's partly about, about infrastructure. It's partly about um, um, the, 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 the research is actually leading that initiative in the first place. Um, in terms of the international element of it, I, mean, I think that's where things like the, the, the COVID coalition, which is aiming to support those kind of initiatives across different countries, particularly in low and income, low and middle income environments, is really, really important. So I think there are initiatives out there, um, but I guess it's about getting them better known so, 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 so people are able to, 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 to link, link in with them. Clement, do you want to comment on this yeah, one as so, well? Yeah, you know, I, I think that the, the challenge that ethics committees uh, face is 
the limitations of the predominant approaches to reviewing studies. So uh, somebody submits a study and there is a set of checklists or that the ethics committee member or the reviewer has to use to evaluate the study. And the checklist is limited to the four principles and the derivative actions from those principles. And that does not include evaluating the study for feasibility. And that may be one of the reasons why many of these studies are getting through committees. And one of the points that um, I was making in my presentation is there is need to include more uh, principles um, that the ethics committees use to evaluate studies beyond these classic ones. So feasibility should be one of them. And if the ethics committee feels that a study is not feasible, then that study probably should not proceed. And with that kind of decision um, made, that will put pressure on study sponsors and on researchers to develop more collaborative studies that are feasible and are more likely to be approved. Great, thank you. So we have a series of questions that sort of relate to uh, governance and leadership and uh, the role of the law. So one is who should take uh, the lead in developing recommendations in a pandemic? Should it be national regulators or leading institutions, the World Health Organization? And a uh, subsidiary to that is uh, how should ethics review committees respond? Should they terminate studies that are futile, repetitive, or unlikely to yield uh, useful results? Who would like to, so one on sort of who has the responsibility, and then once you have the responsibility, uh, what should you do about that? Should you stop these studies from going forward? I'm gonna start with Catherine this time. I've picked on everybody else. <laughs> you can see I'm sort of rotating the uh, locus of responsibility. Um I mean, I think you could make a case for this being a, a, at least a dual responsibility. I think any individual country has the primary responsibility to um, take its own research priorities, which even in a global pandemic may not look exactly the same, um, and, and support those or identify those who think are most important um, and set guidelines for them. But I think the role of the WHO um, in being a genuine, genuine global leader and the, the working groups, expert working groups and so on, that put together for COVID, you know, have, have played a really important role um, if you look, for example, at the, at the guidance that was produced um, a few weeks ago about challenge studies, it wasn't about saying they should or shouldn't go ahead. It was saying, you know, here's the process for thinking about how individual countries, individual ethics committees um, should, 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 should think about these things. So I think that was a very good facilitative way of having a global and um, a, a global approach that you know, isn't everyone just duplicating and reinventing the wheel, but then leaves the actual responsibility where it has to sit in terms of national funders, national um, ethics committees, local ethics committees, making decisions about particular studies. Great, thanks. Uh, Alex, do you want to comment? I, I think I agree with, um, you know, what, what Catherine said. Um, uh, you know, I think the only thing that I would add uh, is that when different countries are thinking about the institutions or, and um, mechanisms that they want to set up to create this kind of platform, I think it's critically important to think about uh, how can we m minimize turning these questions into partisan questions. So um, this has been a particular problem in the in the United States. Um, I, I I clearly didn't say political because uh, pandemics are political issues, and it's going to take political will in order to. Um, you know, create the, the means necessary to address them. Um, but I think what, what, what is in danger, and I think what we've seen with hydroxychloroquine is um, that we've lost a, a grip on the scientific method as being the thing that would de determine whether this uh, intervention works or not. And we, we have to think about institutional designs that will give as, as much as possible, create a bulwark for science and clinical studies uh, to be the, the mechanisms that determine whether something is uh, efficacious or not, whether it ought to be deployed or not. And that information then gets handed to uh, 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 politicians. It, it, it's, I don't think any system would be perfect, but I think that should be a key desiderata in the institutional design. 
Uh, Clement, do you want to chime in there? No, I have nothing else to add. I think those okay. are very good contributions. So picking up, Alex, from your last point, I'm going to sort of modify one of the questions that's been posed. So a lot of arguments were made, you know, there was a huge debate about whether randomized trials were the so-called gold standard, uh, recognizing the gold standard was uh, abandoned in economic thinking uh, in the Nixon era. But there was also a lot of discussions about uh, uh, the rise of adaptive trial design. So uh, do you want to comment on how these kind of, because they're not not straightforward single you know one-to-one -one random the classic orthodox randomization uh, some of them have uh, differential weighted randomization some of them uh, work uh, with uh, sort of clustered designs and other things like that are adaptive trials uh, in, in essence still scientifically legitimate valid methods uh, that have particular use in the context of, uh, of a pandemic would anybody like to so I'll, I'll go to you first, Alex, I know you've thought about this. So just for disclosure, I'm, I'm part of a, a large group that, um, you know, looks at uh, the scientific and ethical issues of um, platform trials, these large adaptive uh, trials. Um, and I have a paper on the, you know, the, the ethics of ad adaptive randomization. Um, I think the, the key thing to say is that I think there are important advantages to these studies. Um, uh, um, the thing I want to resist is seeing ethical, uh, all the complexities that go along with pandemics and then saying, is there an alternative trial design that somehow makes those things go away? That, that I think is not great. Um, I, I think, um, uh, we should choose the trial design. Uh, we should tailor trial design to the question that we're trying to answer. And um, the, the important thing about uh, a, a adaptive platform trials is very often that when you have many interventions that you care about, you can trial them all at the same time and you can make a lot of cross comparisons between um, interventions individually and interventions in, uh, you know, uh, when they're paired together. Um, so they're statistically very complex. They're, they're often difficult to understand. They do have some, some inferential limitations. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I don't like the idea that, you know, that for instance, oh, if someone, if people are reluctant to be randomized, uh, let's use, uh, 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 you know, an unequal weighting. Um, I think the, the, the answer there is if people are, are unwilling to be randomized, you have to convey the, the genuine uncertainty that you're facing and the fact that, 90% uh, of the things that we try in medicine are never approved for anything. And so, you know, and we have to resist the idea that the new thing is going to be better. Um, you know, thousands of people have received hydroxychloroquine. We, you know, the evidence from the trials say not only does it not work, um, you know, it has some uh, cardiac side effects. So, you know, I think managing uncertainty by messaging to people and making sure they understand is far better than by trying to sell them a clinical trial that's going to, that's going to somehow, you know, by reducing the probability that they get randomized to the thing that they don't want. Um, I'm not sure that that's the ethically appropriate way to go. Great. I agree. Uh, Catherine or Clement, do you want to comment as well on adaptive designs? Um, I think I mainly just want to pull out um, Alex's final comment about communication because I think that is that is absolutely critical, both the point of developing the study design in the first place, wherever it's going to be, um, particularly if it's being designed in one part of the world and being conducted um, elsewhere, um, and then in terms of actual actual talking to to, to, to participants. Um, I mean, I think I think one of the the, the value I, I agree with with Alex that the you know, adaptive designs or platform design shouldn't just be seen as a simple silver bullet. I think what we saw in the DRC, though, was that the possibility of actually testing several things against each other actually was a very effective way of dealing with very genuine concerns. You know, it, was a, it was a way forward that sort of worked overall. Um, I think you know, if one's concerned about being randomized at all, then any kind of study isn't going to help. If it's what you're being randomized with a sense of this, this, this loss of hope when there's one thing, as ZMAP was presented in, in 2015 as being, and then nothing. We know it wasn't quite like that, but that was how it felt. And you can't get away from that's how it felt. So I think adaptive designs have that real advantage. They have some of the disadvantages of being incredibly complicated to explain. So, yeah, but they, yeah, they clearly have a valuable role to play. Uh, Clement, do you want to add to this? Yeah, so the, I think the important takeaway is not all pandemics are the same. Context is important, communication, infrastructure, uh, the 
perceptions and the opportunities that the members of society have to participate in studies. Um, a lot of, um, when, you, when you take a product that's already in the market uh, and you're gonna trial it before giving a decision to the healthcare providers, you're going to have a lot of healthcare providers uh, using those products in the context of uh, innovative uh, medicine. Um, as ethicists, we, we, we acknowledge that that happens and recommend that you know, people rapidly take those kind of products into clinical trials. And one of the things that um, looked surprising um, in the current uh, COVID pandemic is we didn't quite used to specify that once the results of the clinical trials come out, you should accept it and then stop your innovative treatment and stop using the, the product that's been found not to be helpful. Uh, and so the kind of the debate kind of just continued when um, technically it ought to have stopped with the release of, of, the, of the studies. But we've seen this in other circumstances also, particularly with the right to try movement and uh, people who participated in studies and the studies say one thing, but they believe something else and they insist on continuing to have access to those products. So communication is critical and not all pandemics are the same. Good, okay. So here's a, a question directly on point about research exceptionalism. So. Due to the understandable pressure of finding evidence during a pandemic, is it ever acceptable that researchers actually begin their studies before uh, IRB or ethics uh, approval? Uh, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm, Catherine, uh, no, Clement, it's your turn to go first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, ethics committees exist to protect society and research participants. Uh, from harm. That's the reason that, that's why the, the ethics committee says it. So it's um, impossible to justify a situation where we um, recommend that researchers go ahead and then give ethics approval a posteriori, um, because in the interval, harm may have been done to participants. And that completely uh, vitiates the need for ethics review. Um, that does not, however, exclude a collection of pilot data uh, that is done by researchers all over the world. But those are usually very small, very quick um, things that do not, in general, involve in, in general involve unproven interventional products. That um, means that anybody who is involved in those kinds of studies is getting less than standard of care. Uh, Alex? Uh, so uh, you and I, Ross, were part of a, a, a meeting at, at WHO, uh, I don't know. 2009. Who, okay, you know, uh, you know where uh, uh, we talked about you can streamline the, re the review process, but you can't get rid of the fundamental, you know, purposes of the review process. And um, I think there's, um, I, I would say, I think that's still the message that um, uh, you should be able to have, not expedited in a technical sense, but very quick, uh, you know, uh, ethical scrutiny and feedback uh, so that that isn't the bottleneck. Great. Uh, Catherine? I, mean, I think we're all, all on the same page here. I mean, I think the, the, the emphasis- It was a is, test question. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know, the emphasis is about how, how you scrutinize appropriately and, and quickly. Um, and I mean, data we were given in our project by the UK Health Research Authority suggested that the studies that involved UK researchers and hence had UK um, ethics approval were turned around in an average of five days during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa with you know, five hour turnarounds for, 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 for changes and so on. So it is possible to do things quickly. Um, I think the other part of that is thinking about the emergency preparedness as it were, you know, how we look forward to the next, next emergency. And I still find it remarkable, we were writing this in sort of you know, the end of December last year, 
to publish our report in, in January, you know, not knowing at that point that, that COVID-19 was, was literally just, 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 just beginning to spread. Um, and this question of preparedness was that's a crucial part of it, how you actually you know, learn from this emergency because there will be another one and how you build up the infrastructure and, and support for that, both in terms of national infrastructure, but where appropriate having a kind of, sort of centralized um, initiatives that the WHO has, has, has done. Well, as usual, this time has gone by exceptionally quickly. We've got lots of questions still, but only a few minutes left. Um, I, I'm struck, Alex, every time uh, uh, since 2009 and 2011 with H1N1 and with uh, Ebola and with Zika and now with COVID, I keep pulling out that uh, WHO report and it was prescient and sensible. And uh, Catherine Nuffield gets the award for the most timely release of, uh, of a report possible because this was just before we were going to the WHO uh, uh, R&D blueprint. I thought, here, you know, ethics has got its uh, act together. We've actually thought about these things. So just in the last few minutes, uh, any closing comments? Uh, and uh, this time I'll start with Catherine. Any uh, words of wisdom uh, on research exceptionalism? Um, well, I think I was struck by what looked potentially like three quite different presentations when we were checking the slides early on. Actually, there's an awful lot of agreements between us that your studies, studies have to be able to find out what it is that they're tasked to find out, otherwise they're wasting, wasting everyone's time. And that involves being able to recruit and being acceptable locally, but it also involves being sufficiently powered. Um, I think much more generally, I think the, the, the big message for me, I think we're just talking about it now, is this idea of, 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 of ethical preparedness and looking forward to what, what we learn. And it's, it's good to hear that the 2009 report you referred to has, has been influential since. Um, it, it, it's it, it's present. It's not necessarily influential. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, uh, Clement. Yeah. So I think the big lesson for me really is the need to continue to work uh, global solidarity on these issues, mm -hmm. and not have these periods in between pandemics where we all go back to whatever it is that we were doing, and then a pandemic comes and everybody starts uh, running around and behaving as if we have no ideas about how to respond to these issues. Or it takes a while for people to remember all the guidelines are written and all the um, information is there in some form, somewhere. So uh, to a large degree, that depends on WHO providing leadership but also requires the cooperation, particularly of the major uh, countries uh, uh, globally to, to get this, to get, to help us all get our acts together. So Alex, you had the first and now you get the last word before I draw this to a close. Hey, um, I think I would say uh, in every um, major disease outbreak, it seems like there's this common pitfall and that is in the desire to give hope, people try to pick a winner in terms of this is the intervention that's going to uh, you know, get us out of this uh, jam. And I, th I think it would be better if we could, um, in the inter-outbreak period, educate policymakers and others so that uh, instead of trying to generate hope by putting their chips on one intervention, uh, we generate hope by saying, here's a platform in which we're going to test all of the things that might work. We're going to quickly find out which one is best. And by participating in this study, um, you're not uh, sacrificing your own health and welfare, but you're creating a genuine public good. And it's an act of solidarity, patriotism, whatever, uh, to get your treatment inside this kind of vehicle. I think it's just a, a massive error that we still uh, treat research um, as a kind of uh, optional uh, uh, undertaking and people are happy to say, this might work, so let's spend, uh, uh, let, you know, let's get 60 million doses for the national stockpile. Uh, that's an awfully big bet. Excellent. Well, Catherine, Alex, Clement, thank you so much. What a highly stimulating uh, discussion and thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules.